Well, Jim, as we are recording this morning, the Wrestling Observer Newsletter 2023 Hall of Fame results, oh, the inductees, boy. the list has been announced. Have you been following this? No, I have not. <laughs> I don't... Uh... I don't vote anymore, no do, nor do I receive a ballot. Apparently, I'm soon not to receive the Observer at all in the mail, as we mentioned a week or two ago. He's ixnaying the print version, which he never took me off the freebie list for after he stabbed me in the back. But um, that's going away, so I'm kind of removed from what Uncle Dave's propaganda machine has been doing last several weeks and i receive a ballot the reason i receive a ballot is because years back you actually told dave that i knew my shit and i should get a ballot and he agreed with you and gave me one but i haven't voted for the last few years because i've had an issue with beyond dave's behavior with you which i've witnessed from a different perspective than most people the actual hall of fame voting body i think it's gotten ridiculous i know certain people who vote who don't know anything you know, I said a few years ago, there was a wrestler who thought Brian Pillman should be in the Hall of Fame. Nothing against Brian Pillman. But when you're up against, you know, Hall of Famers, yeah. it's hard to pick someone else. He didn't get the chance. Yeah, he was really good. And if he had never gotten hurt and a lot of other things, things would have been different. But I have an issue with the voting body. Well, and, and also then it's become at least the Hall of Fame with the Observer when Dave's viewer viewership readership was somewhat normal, consisting of mostly fans of professional wrestling and not the, you know, the trampoline cowboy audience that has taken over that thing over the last number of years, you're dealing with historical figures that, you know, deserve to be in a hall of fame. And it was nice to see and hear and read the retrospectives and the reporting on those folks and, you know, the spirited discussion over, oh, should it be D Dick Murdoch is the, the tipping point? You know, he was always on the edge there, whatever the case. But now it's just ridiculous. And now it's just, again, to fawn over and verbally fillet his friends and the Southern California clown car and everybody that's associated with them. And... It, it doesn't have the same cachet to me that it used to. Even the, even, you know, even the one place you would think wouldn't be contaminated by modern wrestling is contaminated by modern wrestling because Dave and his sycophants insist on shoehorning people like that into this conversation where they don't belong. Well, I think there's a bit of that. I think, again, Dave, not all the readers vote. Dave gives ballots to who he thinks is worthy of a ballot, but I think too many have been given out. And in certain cases, when you see the breakdown, because he breaks it down, who voted by, you know, the, the class of uh, reporter, historian, active wrestler, retired wrestler, you kind of get to see where everyone's mindset is. If that's based on, you know, a few dozen people at a minimum, it's kind of troubling, some of these votes, I think. But let's talk about it, because I'm going to start with the one who didn't get in that I think absolutely probably should have gotten in after this year. Reminder, Kenny Omega's in. <laughs> Kota Ibushi is in. That's what I'm talking about. Roman Reigns is not. Oh, for... <sighs> he All received right. 174 votes, and to uh, become a Hall of Famer, he would have needed 190. Uh, is that right? Or 200 votes to get in. Well, again, it's like, you know, we've just described what we think by actual observation of CODA, and everybody knows what I think of Kenny, but even taking personal feelings aside, just observationally, how can anybody claim that either one of those guys that are already in their Hall of Fame are more accomplished or have contributed more or have performed at a higher level in a wrestling business than Roman fucking reigns. It's just insane. And on that topic, let's discuss this real quick before we get to who actually got in. Roman Reigns received 52.4% of the vote. You need more than 60% of the vote to get in. And if we look at it by class, let me uh, scroll down a little bit here. Amongst the reporters, 
Is that everybody that goes to the AEW scrums? I'm not sure. Amongst the reporters, he's not even on the list. What? He's not amongst the top 30 people. Let me just make sure I'm right about this. Amongst reporters, he is not among... Oh, no, he's number 20 on the list. Oh, oh, there you go. He was the 20... What are they reporting on then? Have they not been reporting on the fact that he's the biggest fucking money drawing star in the his in wrestling right now? Amongst historians, Roman Reigns. Again, I'm not seeing him. Let me just make sure I <laughs> I'm not completely losing my mind. Oh no, he's number eight. Excuse me. Number eight right. on the list of historians, Roman Reigns. So 20 with reporters, number eight with historians. Where is he at with the wrestlers? Active professionals. He is number seven on the list. And amongst retired professionals, he's number four. Amazing how that works out. Because what you have here is you, what do they call that? An inverted pyramid or whatever. The retired wrestlers are the ones that know the most of any of these groups about wrestling. They place him the highest. The active wrestlers would probably be the ones that know maybe the second most. They place him second. The historians, they're smart to who everybody is, but they've never actually been in the business. So they've got him at eight. And the reporters that are supposed to be the experts that talk about this shit, they're the ones that have got him down at number 20. So, well, here's another interesting one. Number one on the list of retired professionals, and he did not get into the Hall of Fame this year, the Observer Hall of Fame. Number one on the list of retired professionals, Randy Orton. Yeah. And, and, and okay, Randy Orton's not in the Hall of Fame, but Kota Ibushi is. See what I'm talking about? The, the, he had some credibility with this because the people that went in we're all historical figures, even if you could debate whether, again, Lord Al Hayes was better than Dick Murdoch or whatever. But over the last, what, 10 years or maybe even less, it's been, it's gone insane with this know-nothing audience that he has cultivated of readers that have taken over his publication. And he is, instead of trying to teach them something, he's rolled over and scratched their belly for him. And that's why you get people that think that Randy Orton and Roman Reigns shouldn't be in the Hall of Fame, but Kota Ibushi and fucking Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang should come right in. Randy Orton's number one amongst retired wrestlers. I do not see him on the list of active historians or reporters. <sighs> well, let's uh, find out who got in this year, Jim. And I apologize for any noise behind me. I don't know what's happening outside. Oh, boy. I, I've got the handle on that this week. I had all the noise. I just took off my headphones to see if it was over here or over there. It's over here now. But, Jim, with 63.2% of the vote... Getting in this year, the first year that tag teams are now a separate category, Raka and Perez. Okay, well, finally, um, yeah, uh, Raka and Perez, again, in any wrestling hall of fame, if you're going to have a tag team, it's got to be them, right? Because uh, they weren't the best in the ring. They weren't as good as the Graham brothers. They weren't as good as the Fargos, but they drew more money. It was context. It was presentation. It was time and place and push and everything. And Perez basically gets in on virtue of being the guy picked to be Rocca's partner when Rocca was cooling off because he wasn't a very good worker. And his ethnic appeal and the, the drop kicks and the cartwheels only went so far. So they juiced him up because he'd been their biggest drawing card in the Northeast and the garden. They juiced him up with a younger, smaller partner that could sell and get the shit kicked out of him and give Raka the tag. And they again played to the ethnic audience that they had at the time because Raka appealed to the Italians and the Hispanics because he was from Argentina and Perez he was Puerto Rican, so the Hispanics loved him, but because he was partners with Rocca, the Italians loved him too. And they got, what, two or three years out of that, whereas for at least two of them, Rocca and Perez, the only tag team 
that were ever really the top box office attraction in the business. Even the Road Warriors never did that. You know, Bob Barnett grew up in Brooklyn, and I remember him telling me, he remembers as a kid seeing, like, in the newspaper, there would just be pictures of Rocco walking around town in the newspaper. Yeah, yeah. And so that, again, if you're going to put any tag team in wrestling history in Hall of Fame, Rock and Perez should be the first ones because they, at least for baby faces, because they kind of set the standard. And I guess you could say even if you're looking at wrestling before 1970, just to pick a year, they would be the only clear cut right away. Well, I shouldn't say only, but they would be the first like, if you're looking at, like, who's the first class of a Hall of Fame of tag team wrestling, you would have to think they'd be near the top. Yeah. And, then. you know, again, this is, um, well, the, there are tag teams. What did he, what did you just say? This is the first year teams have been well, voted on their teams in. Well, I guess the way it works now is you're able to, for people who are on more than one team, if you have been in before, like Rock right. is in already. Rock is in as a singles you, wrestler. Now he's in can, as part of a tag team. You can be in as a tag team. All, I understand now. Okay. Well, and there'll be another example of that shortly. But number two on the list this year, with 63% in their first year on the ballot, the team of the beauty pair. <laughs> <laughs> all righty then. Uh, there you go. I mean, I, I, that's... Um, Certainly Hall of Famers, if you're looking at Japanese women's wrestling, they probably should have been in a long time ago. Yeah, I'll go for it. I mean, they were like, you know, the Popeyes. I can't remember what their fucking names were. All right. Jackie what Sato? What were their names? Jackie Sato and what? Um, what was the other one? You're the Japanese expert. I'm not a big expert in Japanese women's wrestling before uh, Chigusa Nagayo, to be honest with you. All right. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, get to this list again. With 62.9% of the vote, up from 57% last year, finally getting into the Hall of Fame, someone traditionally I did vote for, Sergeant Slaughter. Yes. And and I have in the past also, you, again, you can't avoid the fact that he was not only a top heel for quite some time under a couple of different names, but as Sergeant Slaughter, when they turned him babyface finally, he was the hottest guy in the business for a period of time and one of the top babyfaces. He had longevity. He was a great promo. He was an incredible worker. And he transcended the business with the G.I. Joe stuff, and he was on television. He was omnipresent in the 80s with that. So I see no problem with that whatsoever. Next on the list, Jim, with 61.3% of the vote, up from 53% last year. Was last year the first year allowed? I don't know. Well, now people are getting in, I guess. Jack and Jerry Briscoe. Good for them. So uh, I was going to say, Jack Briscoe is obviously already in. But it says last year they got 53%, so I guess they were voted on last year. Rocket Perez couldn't get in last year. Glad they finally got in. <laughs> well, it's an exclusive club. Coda wouldn't move over. Uh, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, one of the great tag teams of all time. And whenever you do, have... Go ahead. Do you think people don't look at them enough as a great tag team just because of how successful Jack Briscoe was in the early 70s as the NWA champion? Well, that's that's what I was about to say. Whenever you have a guy that, just by virtue of the success he had and the status that he got to, overshadows even a talented partner, whether it's his brother or just anybody, sometimes you have that situation. Jack Briscoe was such a dominant, you know, world champion at the gate for four years, and and the name was everywhere in the NWA territories. Jerry was a good worker and a good amateur wrestler, and a good all-around talent, but he's in the shadow of, you know, one of the era's greats. So, naturally, they looked at him as the younger brother, the little brother, whatever. But when the Briscoes were together, especially when they were a heel team, I mean, when it was Briscoes and Funks in Florida, the Briscoes were the baby faces, the Funks were the heels. But when the Briscoes switched heel in the Carolinas... Oh. It was a different kind of heel team, and it worked so well because everybody knew they were such great amateurs 
that they would be heels by out wrestling the baby faces, but doing it in a prickish way. Well, the promos in those promos, it was yeah. Jerry who stole the show and Jack would just, I don't even know how to explain it. Just stand in the back, not say much, but smirk. Cause he's Jack Briscoe. Yeah. He could back up everything his brother's saying. It was great. Well, and, and that's the thing also is that for those of us who were fortunate enough to meet both at various points, Jerry was kind of the, the over, over the top, well, not over the top, but the uh, outgoing personality and the guy, the funny guy and the blah, blah, blah. And that worked there. So yes, they definitely, any wrestling hall of fame that doesn't have the, both the Briscoes in it wouldn't be very valid, would it? One of the most underrated two-year runs ever is 83, 84 into early 85, right before he quit. Jack and Jerry Briscoe turn heel in the Carolinas and it's them against Steamboat and Youngblood. Yeah. And then they go to the WWF and they're baby faces and they're like, you know, smiling, clapping, you know, <laughs> I don't even know, fists in the air, you know, back and forth, baby face. <laughs> and they have matches with Murdoch and Adonis that are amazing. And they would have gotten the world tag team titles if Jack hadn't quit. Jerry told me once the plan was for Jack and Jerry to get the tag titles and then feud as heels turn heel on Wyndham and Rotunda. Oh. So imagine if we had gotten those matches in 85 instead of Wyndham and Rotunda against the Iron Sheik and Nikolai Volkov. Oh, good Lord. Because Wyndham, well, Rotunda was a heck of an amateur and Wyndham was still in the era where he was one of the best, if not the best guys in the ring in the business. And that would have been incredible. But that's still, I'm sorry, but Jack Briscoe's retirement is still my favorite of all time. To just be there in the snow in that Newark airport parking lot and tell his brother, you know what? I'm going back in that airport and the next flight headed to Florida, I'm going to be on it. <laughs> and, and he did, and he was, and he never came back. I love that. How was Vince told? You know, I don't know. I've, it, that's the one question I never thought to fucking ask, is who told Vince and what did he say? Well, Jim, what do you say? The next person on this list with 60.9% of the ballot, or at least the ballot from his region, and 38% last year, welcome to the Hall of Fame, Tomohiro Ishii. Oh, shit. <laughs> All right. A what mainstay his, in New Japan Pro Wrestling, hard-hitting matches. What is matches. his region? What is his region? Idaho? Because he's a baked potato with arms and legs. His region is Japan, where uh, he needed 140 votes to get in, and he received 143. <sighs> Apparently all based on what he's done in the past. Well, speaking of the past, another figure that, based on the past, certainly would probably deserve to get in. We'll see what you say, but... Making it in with 60.6% of the ballot. First year on the ballot, Blue Panther. Okay. Uh, what do you think? Know anything about him? <laughs> Deserves to be in the Hall of Fame. Yes, he does. Okay, very good. I won't argue with you. Yes, he does. For a lot of years, I'll say, even though you don't like Lucha Libre, and I'm not a big fan of the current stuff, there were a lot of historical figures that were, it was like the list was backlogged. There were too many of them. And now they're all finally starting to get in later than a lot of them probably should have. But finally, Jim. Well, and, and hold on. You just, you made an overgeneralization there. Yes, I don't like Lucha Libre. I liked some Lucha Libre back in the day in its native habitat. But it's like everything else. It's gotten so fucking silly and ridiculous and dangerous and phony looking that, you know, now not so much. Well, not so much phony looking the next person on the list, making it in with 60% of the vote exactly, up from 51% last year, George Kidd. Okay, George Kidd is someone, he was a, a, a technical wrestler par excellence over across the pond in Europe. Scottish, that, I believe. Scottish. That many of the of his contemporaries and many of the wrestlers and everybody says was the, the greatest wrestler they ever saw at that time in that place etc i've not seen him so i'm not going to argue with it at least he's not from cucamonga well that is this year's hall of fame class jim once again rocket and perez the beauty pair or just beauty pair as it says here sergeant slaughter jack and jerry briscoe 
Tomohiro Ishii. That was for you. Blue Thank Panther you. and George Kidd. Let me uh, give you some of the names that did not make it in. Oh, I ahead. was going to say, uh, apparently a lot of bigger names did not make the cut here, and especially in the non-wrestler. There's always a non-wrestler list, and I don't see any non-wrestlers here. Well, let's right now go to the other names based on votes. Almost making it in with 56.8% of the vote. Los Hermanos Dinamita. The Dynamite Brothers out of Mexico, Cien Caras, and Universal Dose Mill, and uh, the other Dose Mill. Yes, all of those doses. They were heavily dosed. Well, they didn't get in. Followed by, at 55.4% of the vote, up from 50% last year, Paul Orndorff. <laughs> now, do you see... No, but this is an interesting question. Do you see Paul Orndorff as Hall of Famer or Dick Murdoch level? You could see the debate. No, well... <sighs> If there was a set amount of people that were allowed into the Hall of Fame and then you called it complete, Paul might not make the cut when we're talking about everybody from Jim Londos to The Rock. But you're telling me that anybody, somebody, anybody believes that Tomohiro Ishii should be in a Hall of Fame in wrestling before Paul Orndorff. Paul Orndorff, one of the great workers of all time. Paul Orndorff of Incredible personality and promo. Paul Orndorff, Hulk Hogan's biggest drawing arena house show opponent. Paul or I, I could go on with Paul Orndorff. Well, I think if Paul but, Orndorff had wrestled in Japan and he was only having to get the Japanese voters because it's a smaller body of voting for that specific region that you need to get voted in, he probably would be voted in. But he's being voted in for a different... Uh, th a different yeah, category. Yeah, yeah, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. He may have drawn more money. Ishii has more stars. The only stars that Ishii has are the ones that he sees every time somebody hits him over the head. Well, Jim, let's uh, see what you think of the next one. At fifty-five point one percent of the ballot, or with that much, first year on the ballot, Young Bucks. <laughs> They couldn't even get in when the fucking people that are voting are Uncle Dave's hand-chosen fucking friends and family plan that would usher them in, and they still don't. They can't win a popularity contest with their immediate family. Well, surprisingly, they did better than a lot of other people on this list. Following them, with 52.7% of the vote, Bobby Davis. Oh, good lord. Followed by, with 52.4% of the vote, Roman Reigns. Okay, so wait a minute. So Dave has now cultivated a readership that thinks that the Young Bucks should go into a wrestling hall of fame before the first most famous, not the first, but the most famous of the pioneer managers and the biggest box office traction in the business. Well, let's see how they did by vote, uh, by category. The Young Bucks were number three on the list of reporters following Tomohiro Ishii and Sergeant Slaughter. And as we've established, the reporters are the group that knows the least about the business. Amongst historians, they are number 15 on the list. Amongst active professionals, they are number 13 on the list. And amongst retired professionals, they are not on the list. They are not on the list. <laughs> That makes a lot of sense. Well, back to uh, who I got to say. Back to who did not get in. Uh, we go international next. Jackie Palo, followed by Dynamite Kid and Davy Boy Smith as a tag team. Oh boy. Followed by Johnny Rougeau. Followed by Jose Torres. Followed by Big Daddy, who's always a controversial <laughs> name on the list. What are your thoughts on Big Daddy? Well, seriously, no. I know that there are a few people, especially from his native country, that have dedicated themselves. But, well, let me go back and say of that, of all those names you just mentioned, Dynamite and Davey, I can see that. Everybody else, maybe they're below that Murdoch threshold. Big Daddy was a, I'm sorry, but everybody that I've ever spoken to that was actually including Adrian I know Street. Adrian Street Adrian didn't like Street. him much. Adrian hated him, and he made sure everyone knew it. Yes, <laughs> that's the but problem. But you can look at the evidence. Yes, it was like it was like an outlaw Hulk Hogan, 
at least Hogan had the body and Hogan could talk and Hogan looked the part of a superhero that he was placed in, this fat fucking gap-toothed, overweight, gray-haired senior citizen with the ridiculous low-rent outfit and the fact that he could do absolutely nothing whatsoever in a ring and the fact that his brother was the promoter is the only reason he was in that spot and he killed the fucking business in an entire country because of the mania surrounding him had everybody take a look at it and realize that this stuff is the shits. And he was the antithesis of everything that British wrestling was founded on, which was technique and action, excitement, athleticism, whatever. No, just demonstrably, when you look at anything he ever did, it was fucking embarrassing and the complete shits. No, he should not be in a Hall of Fame. Even the Ultimate Warrior had a good body. Well, I mean, again, bodies became a thing in America first. Amongst- no, this is, th- but no, but Big Daddy was not just a, well, he might be a little out of shape. Look at the state well, of the was, fat fuck. He was a big fat fuck, I give you that. In his 50s at least, right? And looked 10 years older. But the question is, did it work so you can't deny it? Is there a, a case, is there an argument someone's made that if, before the business went down, if Big Daddy was taken out of that top role, Wrestler X was put in that role, business would have done better? No. But the problem is, is an, an opposite problem in that when you put a guy like that in that spot and get him hot for a period of time to where you get all the eyes on you, then they realize, holy shit, we don't ever want to see anybody do this ever again. That guy and anybody else, because he was so bad. So you've done more damage by getting people to fucking buy a ticket to see him. Because they won't do it again. Well, again, we've uh, discussed a very controversial issue here. I'm sure we'll hear some feedback from a lot of people. We'll discuss it on future shows, Big Daddy. But a few more people here, Jim, on the list who did not get in. In order, we are now at 44.4%. Johnny Saint, followed by Bobby Bruns, followed by CM Punk, (laughs) <laughs> followed by Jim Johnston, the composer. Oh, boy. wait a minute. Jim Johnston got closer than any of the non-wrestling people to being in the hall. I think Roy Welch's name was on the ballot. I believe I remember so. A couple of other people, but Jim Johnston. I, I never had a crossword with Jim Johnston. But how do you balance a guy who wrote wrestlers theme songs for a few years versus a guy who fucking invented the goddamn wrestling business in a large part of the country and was a fucking power and force in it for 40 fucking years what's that vince you have a mastodon (laughs) how does that sound no i uh i like his stuff but he's not uh i mean come on give me a break following him on the list by the way ted turner Followed by Mike Tanay, followed by Shingo Takagi, followed by Junkyard Dog. Oh my God. Uh, uh, wait, JYD is not in the Hall of Fame. He's still not in. This is something, again, another person I voted for because I believe that if you look at just a five year period from 1979 to 1984, or if you go past that to 85, or even 86 because of his popularity, it's undeniable. He was also the biggest star in the history of Louisiana and Mid-South Wrestling. But a lot of people think that he's just some big, fat, overweight guy who had bad matches with Ric Flair, is what they think of. Because they didn't see the real dog. They saw the dog that was fat and on various substances and able to coast because nobody gave a shit in the WWF about whether he had a good match or not at that point. But Jesus H. Christ, again... We're talking about Tomohiro Ishii and the beauty pair being in the wrestling hall of the junkyard fucking dog. 30,000 people in the Superdome. People literally rioting in the streets if he got fucking beat. Um, ah, fuck it. Well, following him on the list, he had a 39.7% of the vote. Following him, Larry Matisik. Then Kevin and David and Kerry Von Erich as a trios team. Followed by Mark and Jay Briscoe. 
followed by Stanley Weston. This is a fascinating oh, now, hold, list. Hold, hold on ahead. Yeah, it is a list all over the place. You know that nobody thought more of Mark and Jay Briscoe than I did, or did. You were their biggest booster, I would say. Um, They should have been a Hall of Fame tag team. And if they'd have gotten the opportunity to be seen by more people and booked properly instead of hidden in Ring of Honor all those years and then what happened. But uh, but no, again, just because somebody's really good at something, sold a lot of records or gained a lot of yards or caught a lot of interceptions or what, it doesn't mean they're all going in the Hall of Fame and, and Mark and Jade never got the chance to have the Hall of Fame career that they could have executed. So some of these people that didn't get in, I'm not saying they wouldn't have if things had gone differently, but some of this is just fucking ridiculous. Well, following the Briscoes was Stanley Weston. Bill Apter's in, by the way. Nothing against Bill, but Stanley Weston should be in a Bill Apter's in probably. Well, no. You don't think so? Because Stanley Weston almost got the fucking magazines, goddamn almost put him out of business because the boys got mad at him and the promoters didn't like that he was going into business for himself and doing all that shit and bill had to smooth some of those relationships over i don't know i, I don't know bill after being in there but no one else from the magazines being in there is an interesting i don't know if i necessarily agree with that and again if you, if you gotta if you gotta have one guy from the american magazine scene in the hall of fame bill is the is the star and then you'd go to stanley weston and maybe lou sahadi well, let's go back to this list. The Royal Brothers, followed by the Grand Wizard slash Abdullah Farouk, followed by Adrian Street, followed by June Byers, followed by Dory Dixon, and Sputnik Monroe with 32.1% of the vote. Sputnik would be close because of what he, the entirety of his career, his overall personality and what he did in Memphis. Uh, but I still don't know that Sputnik maybe would, would be a shoe in and the rest of those names, probably not. No. Do you, do you think there's too many questions about what actually happened or who was actually behind the desegregation of the wrestling events or what the motive was or. Do you well, think no, I'm not even talking about, I'm talking about the uh, just amount of money he, he drew and the people he influenced. He had fucking Sam Phillips's kids in the wrestling business, right? He yeah. could have been Elvis if he ran could, his fan club. If he had come into Memphis two years before fucking he did, he could have been Elvis. Cause, you know, but I have the letter in my files in the wrestling news files that Sam Phillips's son sent in to announced that he's the president of the Sputnik Monroe fan club. Here's a signed permission slip and I'll be running his fan club from Memphis. And, and yeah. And I mean, every high school yearbook from 1959, 60, 61 in Memphis, a lot of the guys had the bleach blonde spot in the front of their head or head in front of their head, front in of front their of head. their hair in in the right in front of their, front head. Of their head in their hair. Um, but no, the questions come from, look, no, Sputnik didn't go on a moral crusade and say this is horrible what they're doing to the African Americans. Sputnik already knew, as, as just as a natural heel, that he could get more heat in Memphis by appealing to the black community as a babyface that white people would get madder at him, right? And because he was so flamboyant and he cut those promos and he trash talked people and he dressed like that, the black people in Memphis loved him and he had nothing against them. And he would go to, and he would get publicity out of going to the Negro cafes as they were termed in the, in the newspaper when he'd get arrested because he was white in a black establishment and it would make the paper and he would do all that shit. But Memphis wrestling under Les Wolf until Roy Welch and Nick Goulas brought it into the Nashville booking office in 57 had been on its ass. And they sent Buddy Fuller in first to book it. And Buddy, one of his guys, was Sputnik. And he'd used Billy Wicks, who was from Memphis. He'd used him in Alabama. So they got that program going and let Sputnik be. And they got the TV at the same time. And the houses started coming, but they still only had 
a small amount of the Ellis Auditorium that was partitioned off or approved or whatever the phrase was in those days for black people to sit in, the crow's nest, the cheap seats up top. And so the seats down at the bottom, they, they were still half empty, but they were turning people away from the crow's nest. And Roy Welch didn't like that any more than Sputnik did, and Sputnik got paid on the fucking house. So Roy Welch was smart enough to know that Sputnik didn't give two shits about what anybody thought of him or any bad publicity, good publicity, or any publicity. So he had Sputnik lead the crusade. I'm not going to wrestle unless they let my black friends in. Well, goddamn, he was the hottest thing. Everybody in town wanted to see Sputnik. All the white people wanted to see Sputnik lose. All the black people just wanted to see him. Well, that's not so, true. I think the white kids Well, the, the, Yeah, the white kid, the kids were always in front of it, right? But the, and Sputnik said this. He had a quote in, um, oh, goddamn, the name of the book. Uh, it, it came, came from, from Memphis, Memphis. By yes. Robert Gordon. Yes, it talked about all of the, the culture that Memphis had influenced with music and blues and wrestling and et cetera. And Sputnik said, the white folks may hate me, but their kids don't. And the black woman that's taking care of their kids don't. And I'm infiltrating their house from the inside. And taken, and they don't realize it. He did change a gen the generation after that. He changed some of them because of the way that they were able to go to the matches and sit next to the other black people, and nobody had a goddamn issue. But it, while it was somewhat, you know, driven by financial concerns more at the start, it did make a change, and and the wrestling folks were the first ones to make it. Hey, how come Sputnik and Fargo hated each other so bad? If you ever saw Memphis Heat, I know you have. Yes. All of a sudden, there's a section where they're just like bad-mouthing each other back and forth. Here's the thing. The first go-round that the Fargos came into Nashville and worked for Goulas and Welch, that was right before, I believe, they got Memphis as part of the, uh, as part of the, the territory. And even though the Fargos ended up working in Memphis, and they did get over. Primarily, it was Nashville, Birmingham, Chattanooga, the fabulous Fargos as a brother team. They did get over in Memphis, but it wasn't as strong as the other towns, and Sputnik was the guy. Sputnik set such a fucking precedent that that was the th It took Fargo until Jerry Jarrett started booking in the late 60s for Fargo to be truly the top guy in Memphis over everybody that had been there and the memory of Sputnik, whereas it was earlier on in the other end of Nick's territory. And I don't, there was probably personal stuff also that I wasn't around for and don't know, don't know if anybody knows, but. Would you say that before Fargo, Sputnik was the biggest star in Memphis wrestling history? Yes, without doubt. Because... <sighs> They never went outdoors until Sputnik came in to the ballpark. The Ellis Auditorium seated 8,000, but you could split it up in half where it, it was one of those double-sided auditoriums like the downtown municipal auditorium in New Orleans. You only had to use half the side, but you, half, half the arena, one side, but you could open it up by the curtain that went down the middle, blah, blah, blah. But still, they, they didn't have a history in Memphis in the 40s and early 50s of doing major houses, even selling out to Ellis Auditorium. And they had had television. WMC in 1948-49, as an experiment, aired some of the matches from the Ellis Auditorium on Monday nights live. But it wasn't until Nick and Roy assumed Memphis, they paid Les Wolf for it or whatever happened, and got television, and Buddy Fuller brought sputnik in and suddenly that summer of 59 they're going out to the fucking ballpark they're drawing ten thousand people then finally the big one with sputnik and wicks with marciano as referee the official count was i think thirteen thousand seven forty nine. but the newspapers reported not 
the promoter hyperbole, and I talked to Buddy Wayne. He was fucking there. The people wanted to get in to see that match so bad, they knocked the fucking outfield fence down, and the cops estimated there was seventeen or 18,000 people in the stadium. Three or 4,000 of them didn't pay. But they said, well, fuck it. What are we going to do? You know, it's, it's Woodstock. And they never, even Lawler, Lawler would sell out the Coliseum on his hot runs. In 74, I think they did seven or eight of them. But he, they never went outdoors because they, they would rather turn a thousand people away from the Coliseum than, you know, the, the old ballpark where they did the Sputnik Wicks match was gone by that point. They would have had to come to the Liberty Bowl or a big college football stadium, and they didn't want to do that in that weekly territory. So Sputnik, to this day, holds the record for the most people ever to see a wrestling match in the city of Memphis due to not only that ballpark show, but also the fact that so many people said, fuck it, we're coming in whether you like it or not, because they were officially sold out. They closed the gates. So yeah, Sputnik was the biggest star in the history of Memphis wrestling before Lawler. And, you know, whatever else happened between him and Fargo personally, I'm sure that played a part because Fargo was the man everywhere else and eventually became the man as a babyface after Sputnik had already gone in Memphis. Well, Jim, just to go back to this list, a few other names, I will just pick out some names that did not get in. Morris Siegel, Randy Orton, Hurricane Ramirez, Edge, Yoshiaki Fujiwara, Spiros Arion, Sangre Chicana. Who? What? He's a Lucha Libre uh, legend. Okay. El Hijo del Santo and Octagon as a tag team. Dominic Danucci, Otto Vons, Tony Schiavone. Kendo Nagasaki. I'm not hearing any names that I'm just incensed about or not in a Hall of Fame, but they're quite recognizable, most of them. Ole Anderson. Ole ought to be in the Hall of Fame. Should Ole be in or should Ole and Gene be in, or do you think it's two separate things? Where do you fall on Ole? Um, as a as a tag team, I'm not sure. The, uh, the Andersons, they were they were penalized by their success in that they never had to leave the Carolinas or Georgia because they were too over there. So a lot of people didn't get to see them. But Ole, again, uh, one of the great tag teams in Southern wrestling, the Andersons were dominant for so long. Ole is a single and with other partners. Ole's promos were some of the best. Ole, at one point... He was a fucking booker that knew what he was doing. He just... Well, that's what I was going to say. Is it like Junkyard Dog where the bad booking is so... Is more recent? Well, but, but now <laughs> but we're, not just, we're not just holding him up for inclusion because he was a booker. Everybody in the Hall of Fame did something bad at some point or rotten or whatever. But I think only such a name that, you know, in a variety of ways in wrestling, I can't see him not being in a Hall of Fame. The Hart Foundation... James Melby, Roy Welch. Again, you know, just one of the four or five people that established wrestling in a large part, territorial part of the country. How, how can that not be alone as a wrestler, as a promoter? He, he was a booker before they had bookers. He just w went in and said, hey, you guys are coming with me. I'm going to get you over. And again, he's not in... I mentioned Mara Siegel before. Paul Bosch is in. Paul Bosch is in. Mara Siegel has to be in. It makes no sense otherwise. But back to the list here. Not in. Rick and Scott Steiner. I'm sure I the fuck. Dave Brown. Tully and Arn with JJ. Wild Bull Curry. You know, can I say, uh, Tully and Arn, I can, I can live with not being in because they really weren't a tag team that long. Two years. And... You know, there's some other things where you say, oh, well, they were each individually great, or they great while they were together, whatever. But the Steiner brothers, tag teams are eligible, and the Steiners are not in the Hall of Fame, one of the top 10 teams of the 90s at least, maybe top five in the 90s. Go back and watch Steiner brothers' matches. They stand out. The crowd reactions, the way they worked, the way they bumped, everything. 
Go yes. back and watch. It stands out. And they didn't hurt you. They were strong enough they could do that shit without hurting you. We know that from experience. Unless you're Chris Champion and you shoot crane kick well, Rick Steiner in the face. I didn't say they wouldn't do it on purpose, <laughs> but no, with, you know, because Stan was not into taking a variety of fucking suplexes, but it was, there was no problem with working with the Steiners. With the Midnight, the Heavenly Bodies, they were beautiful. Uh, well, let me go back to the list here after Tully and Arn, Wild Bull Curry, Bill Goldberg. Wait a minute, and again, Wild Bull Curry is not in a wrestling hall of fame, but the beauty pair are. Is there a bias against ugliness? That should be a plus in wrestling, right? You would think. No, again, Wild Bull Curry for 40 years, one of the great names, one of the great faces, one of the main event fucking stars, one of the foundations of... All oh, right, right, never mind. Yeah, I mean, they could bring him back to Houston when he was an old man. It still meant something. But Bill Goldberg, Seema, Billy Joyce, Hayabusa, Becky Lynch, La Parka, the AAA virgin, <laughs> Manami Toyota and Yamada, Joe Higuchi, Angel Blanco and Dr. Wagner, Bob Cottle, Rosie Ogawa. You know, I just thought if, 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 if we were reading that list to Bob Cottle, when we got to his name and that followed the others, it, it, I could just see his face because he would have thought, who, who are those other people they just mentioned? Well, it goes on from there, and I'll just mention drop from next year's ballot. They got less than 10% of the vote from their region are the Von Brauners and Saul Weingroff, okay. Seth Rollins, <laughs> Pirata Morgan, Mike Marino, and Sanshiro Takagi. Well, I don't mind any of those people being dropped except the Von Brauners. Are they like a Murdoch case for, for tag teams? Someone needs to make a coherent argument and explain it to people that know nothing about them, who they were, how big they were, where they worked, and again, Florida, Tennessee, all over the South. California, they had a run, right? Someone needs to actually explain how impressive. I mean, they were drawing better than AEW, weren't they? Yeah. <laughs> in a lot of these towns. <laughs> so, I mean, it's something that, uh, that should be looked at, but also dropped from next year's ballot due to the 15-year 50% rule, Big Daddy, Jackie Palo, and Kendo Nagasaki and added to next year's ballot, Asuka, Zane Breslov, Psycho Clown, El Dandy, George Gordienko. <laughs> I'm glad he could finally make it onto the ballot after all these years. Gran Hamada, Samoa Joe, Kento Miyahara, Cody Rhodes, Yoshihiro Takayama, Kevin Owens, Zack Sabre Jr. Oh, for God's sake. Ma Zack Sabre Jr., that Q-tip-headed fucking stick, that buggy whip. He's won a lot of Observer Awards. Oh, Mascarita sure Sagrada, The Usos, Volador Jr., Koichi Yoshizawa. That's interesting. Koichi. Bray Wyatt. And finally, Sami Zayn. They will all be added to next year's ballot. I'm... Uh again dumbfounded at some of these names and even you know for heaven's sake zach saber jr even if he was worth a shit and didn't look like he was 12 years old and fucking anemic he's still wrestling what is he fucking 35 years old how can we be talking about halls of fame for people who have to be carded to buy cigarettes and again kota abushi got in a few years ago look at the state of him today <laughs> Does he look like a Hall of Famer today, just after getting in a few years ago? Here's what Dave wrote. We'll end with this. Here's what Dave wrote about the Young Bucks, because that's the one a lot of people were looking at. The Young Bucks on the first ballot came in at 55%. It was notable in that many people expected they'd get in easy. And I've said that for years, based on longevity as a top tag team, and multiple Tag Team of the Year awards. In the 43-year history of our awards, no tag team has had as many points for Tag Team of the Year, and in the different match rating systems, it's generally the Young Bucks with the most highly rated matches, oh, and God. that it's systems I have nothing to do with. 
In other words, my <laughs> readers masturbate more often and more fluently and, and more fruitfully to the kids from Cucamonga than they do to any other boy band that they've been fans of. Dave put a defense of himself there. That's the interesting thing. Let me read that again. In the 43-year history of our awards, no tag team has had as many points for Tag Team of the Year. And in the different match rating systems, it's generally the Young Bucks with the most highly rated matches. And that's systems I have nothing to do with. <laughs> You know, he just influences the reader to, to go about his own. Here's the thing. The fucking people reading Dave's Observer are the last people that need to be rating matches because they are looking at these goddamn gymnastics cheerleading exhibitions as if they are something to do with professional wrestling. And they will overlook these weak, pale, flabby, balding, small, minute, microscopic, not tough, very, very pussyish, smarmy-faced individuals pretending to be badasses so they, they can do cartwheels and backflips and round-offs. We ought to get them with some round-up, kill the weeds and all the pests. Well, let me finish what Dave wrote here. Yeah. Add in, they're changing the game both with opening up merchandise and even more, the formation of AEW adds historical significance. They actually may have done better last year, given they had something of a cold year this year as far <clears> as titles and such. <laughs> titles and such, such being drawing fans, ratings, or getting people to want to cheer for them. And AEW declined in popularity. Normally, I'd view 55% as being people who will eventually get in. But the Bucks also have people who won't vote for them for a number of reasons, perhaps the biggest being the idea they don't belong because they never worked on top in WWE. Oh, good Lord. Do you think that's the biggest reason people wouldn't vote for them? No. There's a lot of great talent that didn't work on top in WWE. These guys just suck. And they're obnoxious about the fact that they suck. They think they're great. So, no, they would kill the business, change the business, whatever. If you're a wrestling fan, if you're a fan of professional wrestling, they offend you. And apparently, they offend a lot of the former fans they had in AEW because people won't even watch them on that program now. And that's the only audience they had that could stomach their goddamn effluvia. Well, that was the Observer 2023 Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hall of Fame class. Congratulations to all the inductees. And if you're the Young Bucks, you may have woken up today thinking you're going to be in the Hall of Fame. How could you not? When you think of the Wrestling Observer, you think of the Young Bucks. And you may say, what the hell has happened here? You may want to sue. You may want to just lay back and let me take over on this one, Brian, because I'll tell you, here's the thing. Here is the exact situation. If you feel that you, you should have been voted into a Hall of Fame for what you do just because everybody likes you, whether you're any good at it or not, and your friends want to vote for you, and you don't get in, well, that's when you might want to sue. That didn't make any more sense than yours, did None, it? No, no. Just play the music. Call Stephen P. To the rest. You know, Brian, I've just realized that we had the answer earlier on in the program. Tony Khan is down one legal beagle, one ace barrister, the, the person in charge of his legal uh, business and efforts up until now has been transferred away from the wrestling to some other part of the Khan empire. Khan! So, somebody needs to replace that person that's been moved on out for whatever reasons. I think Tony ought to call Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 87750-STEVE. Because if Tony 
had called Steve New, then Stephen P. New could go over there and say, Tony, you need to leave this whole thing to me. You're just, you're, you're, you're fucking up here, pal. And he could go in there and write the wrongs. He could rewrite the contracts. He could tell people, keep their mouth shut. He could yank a knot in somebody's tail, as Mama Cornette used to say, get that place in ship shape order, dust off his hands and Consider another fine job done, don't you think? I think Tony should get his own attorney and leave uh, our attorney alone. It's a conflict of interest. Uh, I'm thinking about suing Tony Khan myself for sexual harassment. Hey, he told me he was only going to be friendly to you. But I'll tell you, you know, here's the thing. Stephen P. New, he's the man for you, no matter what kind of legal issue you might have to bring up. And he doesn't need to get transferred away because he doesn't he doesn't dilly-dally. He doesn't dip his pen in company ink. He's there to work for you and you only. As he goes about handling your wrongful termination or your injury or illness caused by someone else's negligence or just outright obnoxiousness. Again, Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 877-50-STEVE is his new number. He had to get his number changed because it was written on so many jail cell walls because he's the only person that can get a lot of these people sprung anymore. Once hey, again. you know, by the way, when, when I did not know that Megan was a real person, remember that one time that Tony got a little upset at me because I said something that he felt violated the non-disclosure agreement? Oh, yeah, I don't even remember what it was, yes. Yeah, yes, but I got a message <laughs> on my machine and, you know, Megan, she not only, she has a bit of an accent and she speaks very quickly. And I was not aware that she existed on the planet at this time. So I got a message from somebody named Megan so-and-so uh, saying that she was calling me on behalf of Tony Khan and I should call her right away. Well, of course, I didn't fucking do that because I thought it was some Mark Ribbon me. And she called Stephen P. New. And he's the one that had to set her straight on what would and wouldn't go on, and he did that, boom, just like that. So if he can do it to her, he can do it to anybody. But he didn't do it to her, because I said he doesn't have inappropriate relationships. He just said it to her. He didn't do it to her. <laughs> Stephen P. New, newlawoffice.com, 877-507-8383. Yeah. An easy way to remember it, as opposed to Mr. Throwing Out Names and uh, Numbers. Well, uh, hell, hello, Mr. First Name Bunch of Numbers.